Good morning, everybody. There we go. My name is John, and I'm the pastor here at Vernon, and we are so excited to have you join us in worship. Uh, it's exciting this morning. Um, we have a number of uh, people we are going to be welcoming into our body this morning in worship, and so that is exciting. Um, we also have a few announcements. Our adult education is going to start in February. There's more information on the What's Happening uh, wall here at VL VELC. Uh, we do encourage you, there's a couple books that I recommend picking up. We're going to study the Gospel of John. And then uh, after we get through Holy Week and Easter, um, we're going to take a short break. And then we're going to jump into the book of Revelations. Who's excited about that? Right? <laughs> Don't trust anybody who says they understand the book of Revelations. But we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna jump into that because we think the author of Revelations was... Let's spend a few minutes and just talk about how much the name John means to us. <laughs> but we're going to jump into that. Uh, there, there's so many things going on. We also, our grief share group will begin again in February. A schedule's not made for that. Uh, we're going to have our first meeting on a Monday, uh, the first Monday in February. And then after that, Anne, we're actually going to put together a schedule. Yes, a schedule. So <laughs> our grief share group, a number of times this past uh, fall and winter, and uh, I can't speak for the group, but I know for me, as someone who continues to process grief, it was, it was extremely helpful and meaningful. So please, please, if you're interested, join us. These next few weekends, we got a lot going on. Um, are there any other announcements? I have two more I want to make. Any other announcements? Um, on Monday, you can go to the next slide, uh, Pat. On Monday, we celebrate uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. This is one of my favorite quotes. Use me, God. Show me how to take who I am, who I want to be, and what I can do, and use it for a purpose greater than myself. Um, we celebrate... Uh, a man who was uh, joined by other, many other men and women uh, and part of a movement that helped us to uh, break down some walls that had been separating people for a very long time. And so we celebrate him on Monday. And then also on Monday, this week is like our youth ministry uh, birthday week. So uh, on Monday, the one and only Ann Galinsky turns 22 years old. Where's Ann? Where's Ann hiding? Out there, yep. And then I believe it's Wednesday, but she won't tell me the actual day, and I'm fairly positive she ran off at this point. But Sherry Higgins, Sherry Higgins will be celebrating her 33rd birthday. And so uh, just a big happy birthday to Ann and Sherry, and a big thanks for all they do for our youth here at Vernon. We love them, love them, love them. I think that's it. And our senior Bible study is this Wednesday at 1030, and I'm not being goofy. Guess what book we're going to be studying the Gospel of John in the third chapter. So please, please join us at 1030 uh, for our senior Bible study here at Vernon. And uh, also a big thanks to our Caring Hearts um, and Caring Hands ministry. We delivered boxes and bags of wonderful uh, hats, mittens, and clothing to uh, the ELCA Outreach Center in Kenosha this past week, as well as a number of other places. I'm trying to find Barb's eyes somewhere. As far as a number of other places, which were? Hope. Hope Inc. in Waterford. Country Caring in Hartford. Heartland. The Hope Center and another one. There's so many, and we give all sorts of thanks for that ministry. It's just awesome. Warm hands and warm heads in winter, especially on weeks like this, are awesome. So. I think that's it. Friends, I get to, I love this. We get to welcome some members into worship this weekend and next weekend. Um, and so I, will, I would like to invite our new members to please come forward. Also invite Mike Simonson up here. And uh, if, you, if you all could come up here and gather facing me. So you can gather just kind of right in here in this area. There's no assigned seating. Now they all filled out the 30-page test. Uh, and most of them passed, Ray. But we, uh, friends, I, I'm so excited to welcome them in. And you, you also get prizes and stuff. So uh, I, the people standing in front of you today, whose names you will hear in a moment, they have been worshiping with our community for a while now. Um, and in spite of me, they continue to come back. And, and I want to just tell you how excited we are to have you. So we have some words here. Congregation, you're going to be a part of this too, as you're going to welcome them into this worship space as well. Um, but, I, but I would invite you all to uh, just prepare your hearts uh, as we talk to God about these new members. Friends, we are here this morning to welcome these new members into the community, which is Vernon Evangelical Lutheran Church. We are not a building, but we are the gathered family of God. 
We are brothers and sisters in Christ, given this new identity through our baptism into Jesus' death and resurrection. And today we welcome you as members of this larger body of Christ. And so we ask Mitchell, Amy, Heidi, Ray, Piper, Tucker, and Sharon, do you desire to join the membership of Vernon Evangelical Lutheran Church? If so, please answer, I do. Congregation, and I want to hear a resounding we do. Congregation, do you promise to support, encourage, and extend love to these new members of our community? If so, please answer, we do. We do. Friends, we now welcome you into the family of our congregation and into the ministry of the church. As active followers of Jesus Christ, we are called to spread his good news, and we encourage you to accept that call through your involvement in this community. We will. We welcome you as fellow workers in God's kingdom, inviting you to grow with us in our faith, reaching out to others in the good news of Jesus Christ. We welcome you as sisters and brothers in Christ and thank God for this unique opportunity to serve God and one another. May God be, may the God to whom we belong equip us for good work that we do together in his name. Let us pray. Almighty God, as you called James, John, Simon, and Andrew to fish for people, so you have called us to serve you with our talents and resources. We thank you for bringing Mitchell, Amy, Heidi, Ray, Piper, Tucker, and Sharon into this community as new members. You have told us that wherever two or more are gathered in your name, there you are with them. Help us, we pray, to see and feel that presence and that others may come to know you through their interaction with us. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. Friends, let's welcome our new members into worship. You get things, you get things, all right? This is for you guys. Uh, look, there's names on there. So if you could, this is Ray, everybody, and Heidi, and Tucker. You've seen Tucker and Piper join me up front. Piper and Tucker. This is Mitchell and Amy, and this is Sharon. Welcome them one more time, friends, into our community. Thank you, brother. Huh? Show them your faces, everybody. So please, please welcome them uh, this morning in worship when you get a chance. They've got some delicious baked goods. There we are. All right, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Mike. Let's just give them some walking off music. Now I'll invite Miss Annette up for our prayer of the day. Okay, am I on now? Beautiful. The prayer of the day. Please join me. Patient God, your son Jesus expressed anger at abuses and injustice. Help us to show concern, not apathy, for injustice in our world. And teach us to make right all that may be wrong. Amen.
Friends, in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord and Savior was with his best friends, sharing a meal. And during the course of the meal, they took bread. Jesus took the bread and then blessed it, broke it, gave it to all to eat, saying, this is my body broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Then later after supper, the wine was poured. Christ again surprised them by blessing the cup, giving it to all to drink, saying, this cup is a new covenant, shed my blood for you and for all people. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us pray the way our Savior taught us as we enter this meal. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come. Thy, thy will be done, be done on earth, earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, last week and this week we just pulled a little bit on our cautions and worship. And uh, as I said last week, uh, this is a, a short time thing, and we will be getting back to what we consider more normal practices very soon. Uh, but this week, as you come forward for communion, I will ask that you come forward with your hands like this, and we'll drop the element into your hand, and then you can head back to your seat. All are welcome at this table, given so freely in Christ's death and resurrection. Amen. of this meal. Thank you for the sustenance. Thank you, God, that in this meal you promised to equip us to go into the world and to create the church you've called us to create. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. The scripture reading is from John, second chapter, verses 13 through 25. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem in the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews, no, the Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, the disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. When he was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in his name 
because they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, would not entrust himself to them because he knew all the people and needed no one to testify about anyone. For he himself knew what was in everyone. Here ends the message. Thank you, God. Thank you, Miss Annette. God is good? All the time. Come on up, young people. We're going to pray, Miss Heather, Miss Kay, Miss Kim, and then we're going to send them out today. Uh, Miss Kay, and I, I noticed that I got done a little early last week, so she's given me permission to give a much longer sermon this week, right? <laughs> to kind of stretch out that time. Friends, we, we, look at these beautiful people. Look at this. Raise your hand if your name is Trip. Let's have Trip stand up real quick here. Thank you. I heard it might be your birthday. Is that true? What are you, 33? How old are you? Six. You're, you're only six. You got a job? I'm six. Not yet, but soon, Dad. I'm but soon. Six you're six too. Well, it's his birthday. So, friends, we're going we're gonna to do a happy birthday. You know, we got these rules with no singing. We'll just, I don't know, we'll do it in a fun way. Let's, uh, let's just speak it. I don't know. Let's say, but hey, Trip, you deserve a giant birthday. So how about a one, two, three, happy birthday, Trip? One, two, three, happy birthday. Man, you have fun today, Trip. I think we're going to see you later, too. All right, friends, we're going to pray, and we're going to head out of here, okay? All right, so it's one of those repeat-after-me prayers. All right, let us pray. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for loving us. Help us to love others the way you love us. And thanks for Trip. He's awesome. Amen. All right, friends. God is good all the time. Great. We're going to walk towards Miss Heather there. We're going to walk. We're going to walk. We're going to walk or crawl, whichever one. I was there the day that Jesus walked into the temple. He just stood there at first, almost as in disbelief. And then I saw it. I saw that fire growing in his eyes. I'd come from Galilee to the place where God said he'd meet us. Did it feel like a scam? Yeah. I was never able to afford a lamb for my sacrifice, so I had to settle for one of those overpriced pigeons. As a young wife and mother, there's a word you never expect to be called. Widow. I didn't realize how safe I'd felt with my husband around until he was gone. And then it just felt like being exposed on every side with nothing in between your babies and a world of vipers. But me, just me. So I stood there that day in the temple and I watched as Jesus grabbed a whip and drove those businessmen out of the temple, poured their money on the ground. But more than that, there was something about the expression on his face. I recognized it. He swung that whip like vipers were threatening his kids. He said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. <laughs> Took me three years to figure out what he meant. <laughs> Slow learner. <laughs> he wasn't talking about the building. That was a place where dishonest men put their grimy fingerprints all over God's glory. They defiled the intimate process of worshiping Him. That day wasn't about destruction. It was about hope. Because now, knowing God is all about Jesus. As I think about that day back in the temple, and I remember what 
Jesus did and how he did it. It felt like being rescued. Life can still be brutal. The kids' appetites are still growing. I still cry a lot. But he made a place for me to be still, where rest and trust meet right there at God's feet. And the price of that access, it's paid because of Jesus. He conquered death, and that's how I make it through life. Good morning again. I appreciate that perspective that she offers. Can you imagine being a witness at that temple that morning? Hear these words again that Annette read for us. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. If you ever wonder, by the way, in scriptures, how we kind of assume that we talk a lot, maybe you haven't heard this before, we think that Jesus might have been in his 30s. The scripture gives us all these different clues as to what his age might have been. And scripture also gives us clues about how long he ministered with his disciples. If you read uh, the Gospel of John like we're doing, it, it'll feel maybe like a year of his life. But the reality is because of the amount of times he went to Jerusalem for the Passover, this is early, right? He would be at the Passover again in John and then later at the end as he shares the Passover meal with the disciples. So there were different times that he had gone up to Jerusalem. That's how we mark the dates and times that Jesus would have spent with his disciples. But the Passover of the Jews was near, early in the Gospel of John. And Jesus goes up to Jerusalem, and he goes to the temple, and he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables, making a whip of cords. He drove them all out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers, and he overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here, stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered what was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days, in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it back up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body, after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Pastor Ben Johnson Crazy tells a story about how one day uh, he was rummaging around in his house and he found this drawer that he'd never uh, looked in before. He opened it and he found that it contained five eggs and an envelope with $1,000 in it. And so he went to his wife and he said, Honey, do, do you know anything about this drawer? And she told him that every time he gave a bad sermon, she puts an egg in that drawer. And he said to her, wow, after all these years in ministry, only five eggs, not bad at all. What about the $1,000? She said, well, every time I get to a dozen eggs, I sell them. <laughs> Isn't that good? I like that. Jesus had some incredible sermons. If you are a devout churchgoer or if you are somebody who pops by for Christmas and Easter, no judgment. But if you, if you are around just even a little bit, you know some of these sermons. I think you do. You know so the, there's a sermon on the mount. Blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. The sermon on the plain, do, do not judge and you will not be judged. Some of these great lines from Jesus, his sermon by the sea where he spoke about the kingdom of God being here and now. Not some far off thing, but something offered to us here physically now. Lots of sermons. You couldn't blame people if they thought that Jesus was saving a really, really, really good sermon for his entrance into the temple. Could you imagine, right? Like Jesus is out there, kind of like a country preacher, but then he walks into the cathedral. Like, what's he going to say? And here's what he does. Making a whip of cords. He drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins. He told those who were selling doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. 
that's not a sermon that I would necessarily feel comfortable preaching, and it does not sound like a Jesus sermon. Though I do wonder if Jesus was here today, if he was going to preach today, what would he have to say to us? Most of us in our minds, I think, like to make Jesus out to be this peacemaker, which he was, the gentle teacher who loved and forgave, which he does over and over and over again, or this great prophet who shared good news and welcomed the children. All of these things Jesus was. It's important to have a little bit of context. It's important to know what's going on in the temple. Last Lent, uh, we went through the story, uh, the, the series with Adam Hamilton, and we got to see different places in Israel or in, in that area, in that region where Jesus ministered to, and you got to see the ruins of some of these places. The temple, which was originally Solomon's temple, began by his father David, completed by Solomon. This massive temple was eventually destroyed by the Babylonians. Fast forward many, 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 many years, and Herod the Great, as he was known, not the Herod in Scripture, but another Herod before him, was building a temple for how many years? 46 years. And, and it, for the most part, it had been completed. But there were things going on in the temple that were confusing. Some of them had to do with law found in the book of Deuteronomy about what you're, the, the, the appropriate, proper sacrifices to bring into a sanctuary. But, but the church had taken it a step further. So let's shoot back a couple thousand years. Let's say as that widow was talking about, or, or perhaps you are with a spouse and you travel to Jerusalem during the Passover and with you, you bought some sort of sacrifice to God, the appropriate sacrifice, and they knew where to go. They would go in the Hebrew scriptures and in Deuteronomy, it actually says like which animals are appropriate sacrifices. So they know this, they go there. And in many, many cases, you would bring perhaps a ram or, or two turtle doves to offer in the temple. But the problem is when you arrived at the temple, guess what had begun happening? This had been happening for a while. A priest would meet you at the door to inspect your sacrifice. And in many, many cases, the animals were rejected. Maybe the priest claimed that they were too old or they weren't the right size or they had spots or blemishes. But don't worry, the priest says, we happen to have our very own hand-picked sacrifices here for you to buy today. One time only. Never mind that the markup on rams and turtle doves or whatever it might have been for the Salem Temple was extremely significant. So you had two choices. You could leave, probably acknowledging the injustice of what's taking place, or, or pay to upgrade your offerings. So you get out your money, but, and you buy your replacement ram or turtle dove, but then you realize, oh, the coinage I have is the coin of the time. It's the coin of Rome. But Rome's coin is not welcome in the temple. So then you have to go over. Hold on. Before you get the animal, come over to these tables. You got to change your money. We'll take the Roman coin from you. Here's some money that can only be used in the temple. Use that then to go purchase. You see how this works? I mean, as church fundraisers go, this is a pretty lucrative scheme. Listen. Make people bring animals to sacrifice at the temple. Tell them their animals aren't good enough. Charge them for new ones. Refuse to accept the money they brought with them. Instead say, give us your money. We'll give you different money, funny money, that you can only use here. Then take those temple coins when they buy the animals that you are forcing them to buy and put them right back in the coffers. Jesus shows up to this disgusting display. And I, I, I like to believe, as God, Jesus knew what he was walking into and then his humanity is on display. He, he by all accounts, loses it. He, he appears to become unhinged or unmanageable. He grabs a cord. He makes himself a big old whip. And he starts whipping it at people and animals, driving them out of the temple. He flips over these tables. And I want you to really think about it. I mean, he's knocking over these tables. Coins are scattering. What's fascinating in Scripture, and if you've ever watched like, the Gospel of John or, or some different uh, biblical narratives that have been put to, to, to cinema, uh, you'll see that the crowds run away. Could you imagine? I feel like even in this place, in this place, if I started doing something crazy like that, like Ben would come up at least and be like, hey, man, you good? Like, you know, like, I mean, we, we, but nothing happens. For some reason, they are moved by what he is doing. And, and the only people to speak up are the Jews who aren't even that confrontational. They're kind of, it seems, at least it appears that they're a little bit afraid. And they say, hey, man, you know, like what sign can you show us to like uh, excuse the message you just made? 
What would it be like if Jesus was alive today and walked our streets, if he had chosen this time and this place to appear, to enter in and to create his ministry in this world? Where would he go? Like, where would he go? What would he say? I think we catch ourselves, uh, I do at least, time, from time to time, assuming that Jesus would fit in or at least look and sound and act and smell like the Jesus in my mind, that he'd be likable, he'd be the approachable teacher who commanded the world's attention and easily turned our love, respect, and admiration, uh, admiration towards him. I, I want to believe that's true. I think the truth is, though, if we look at Scripture, things being the way they are, humans being human, we have, we have other labels for Jesus. There's a reason we call God's love radical. It's because it doesn't make a lot of sense. Forgive your enemy. How many times, says Peter? Seven? Seven times 70, says Jesus. The truth is, however, however we want Jesus to look, however we want Jesus to sound, the reality is Jesus came into the world that he came into, and he was an agitator. He was a radical. He was a malcontent. And depending on whose perspective you had, he was a troublemaker, right? Jesus was flipping over tables. Driving people out of the temple, his father's house, every right to be angry. People like Jesus make headlines for disturbing the peace. Talked about on Monday, we celebrate MLK and Martin Luther King Jr. Has anybody ever read a letter from a Birmingham jail? You should read it. Have you at least heard of it? Everyone's kind of heard of it. Martin Luther King wrote this. Uh, he had been arrested for protest. But he, he wrote it not to like the greater world. He wrote it to, to white church leaders who had written him a letter and had asked him, these are southern white church leaders, who had asked him to be a little quieter. This, this, is, this is real. This is, he was responding to them. And if you read it, it was a beautiful, it's a beautiful letter. I mean, it's, it's full of conviction and it's heartfelt. And he doesn't, he doesn't throw you know, punches at these leaders. But he just says, I follow a savior who spoke into unjust systems and made lots of noise about him, so much so that I got him killed. It was written to people who just wanted the peace for peace's sake. Author and teacher Barbara Brown Taylor, who I've quoted before from here, she's an Episcopal priestess, but she's just a fantastic writer. Um, she was ret uh, attending a retreat once, and the leader of the retreat asked the gathered people, who... Who in your life or who have you observed in your life that, that most represented Jesus Christ to you? That was like the embodiment of Jesus for you. And, and when it came time to share their answers, she said, she'll never forget, one woman stood up and said this. Oh, I had to think really hard about that one. She said, because I kept asking myself over and over again, who is it in my life who told me the truth about myself so clearly that I wanted to kill them for it? Jesus came into the world and spoke to the leaders, spoke to the authority, spoke to the governor of that region, spoke to all the people in power, spoke to the king, spoke to them, and, and condemned them, not, not in a way that gave them no chance for redemption, but instead loved them and argued against their domination, argued against their hate, argued against their violence, and offered something else, argued against the corruption in the temple, You know, we forget this about Jesus. Jesus, if you look through scriptures, which is where you should go to learn about Jesus. When you look through scriptures, Jesus didn't really care that much about whether or not people liked him. Even at the end of Annette's reading today, right? Where, where he, you know, he revealed himself to so many and not to others because he knew everyone's heart. And they would in time know the fulfillment of what he had come to do. He, he wasn't so much worried about you liking him. He often preached at his own expense, right? I mean, he said things to people all throughout the scriptures. We're going to read it in the Gospel of John. A scene will end, and the religious leaders will say, and they conspired to kill him because he gave a sermon. I hope I've never <laughs> preached a sermon that one. But this was happening. The company he kept, tax collectors, prostitutes, People who worked on the Sabbath, 
Samaritans, all of these people that the, 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 the leaders of that time, especially the religious leaders of that time, said you don't associate with them. They're not welcome in the temple. They're not worthy of your time or your love. And Jesus flips it all upside down. He was a disturber of the peace. Remember when I was in Kenosha, I'd heard the story about a family, and the kids in this family walked home from school every single day, not because school was close by, not because they wanted to, but because apparently mom drank all day long. And by the afternoon, she was in no condition to drive, so they walked home, and no one, including their dad, said a thing because it was best not to disturb the peace. But that wasn't peace. It was fear, it was shame-induced silence, and it begged for disturbance, and it eventually, it eventually needed it to, to right some wrongs. You see, in that relationship you have with the other person who disappoints you again and again and again, and so gradually over time you ratchet down your expectations. Have you ever been there? You know they're going to let you down, so you just lower the bar a little bit. And you get to this point where you have sacrificed everything just for the, the peace that you so desperately were clinging to. But that's not peace. That's self-imposed indifference. And while that's a small example, there are many large global examples where we have self-imposed indifference, where we have communal imposed indifference, and peace demands disturbance. In our city and in our country where the rich keep getting richer and the poor keep getting poorer, friends, where the average age of homelessness in our country is nine, where we criminalize many of the symptoms of poverty without treating the disease of poverty, Where 51 years ago, Dr. King gave the speech, I have a dream, and yet we still see pockets of racism that are corrupting our country. It's not peace. It's denial, and it must be disturbed. You see, we're not done. We're not done. Christ didn't come back, resurrected, and go, you guys are covered. You don't have to work towards any of this anymore. And before you're you're taken aback, I'm not talking about salvation. The God of the cross, the God of Easter, the same God who we celebrated at Christmas, that incarnate God, that God that spent time with us. God has offered us God's unconditional free love given to us each and every day, something we are told we cannot lose. That's the promise. Yet God entrusted the church with responsibilities. We were supposed to be a community that acted different, that looked different. We welcome new members in, and hopefully after the sermon, you're still going to be here. We welcome new members in, but you are called to go out in the world and be different. You are to be, in the appropriate times, disturbers of the peace if you see injustices. And don't just think grand, right, in your own home. Guys, gals, we, we have been entrusted with such responsibility, but we've also been gifted with such amazing gifts. I see these kids come forward, and I think any parent in this room, right, you think about it, no matter how old they are, but if you have younger ones, you just, what world are they growing up in? It's unlike anything I experienced. And how are our lives modeling for them the way they're supposed to live, the way they're supposed to lead with kindness, stand up for those who are Powerless. Jesus, the same Jesus that we read about in the temple story today, that is the same Jesus that we pray to this morning. That same Jesus that is working in our churches, through our leaders, through all of you, through the way you encourage me and you encourage each other. It's the same Jesus who longs to work in your relationships to help you when you are the abused, and also to help you if you are the abuser. It's the same Jesus who who comes into our temples flipping over tables of discrimination and inequality. It's the same Jesus who has called us to look different. It's the same Jesus who says, don't get caught up in all of the arguing and finger pointing. Instead, get caught up in all of the forgiving and loving. Get caught up in a way that calls out injustice, but also stands side by side with that person and says, I'm not going to go anywhere until we understand that we are created in the image of God together somehow. You know, maybe you're the one demanding silence or you're the one who's too afraid to speak up. Jesus longs to come into the temple of that relationship where you are struggling with that thing that you are struggling about. Jesus wants to disturb the peace, but Jesus does so in a way where Jesus doesn't abandon you. Jesus says to them, tear down this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. 
2,000 years later, we can look at that scripture and have a good idea about what Jesus is talking about. For, for those leaders at the time, that seemed impossible, right? It's almost funny how to them tearing down a temple and raising it in three days isn't the most startling thing that Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, you are going to kill me. You're going to kill me because I'm arguing against your self-interest and I'm arguing against your decision to put people in categories. I'm arguing against all of it. And I'm telling you that the first appropriate response is to love unconditionally and you're going to kill me for it, but I'm going to come back. I'm going to offer the gift of the Holy Spirit to the church, and it's going to change the world, not through power and dominance, but through living together, through figuring out life together. Bishop uh, Will Willimon says, in my experience, churches always hope that it is possible to be faithful to the mandates of Jesus Christ without the pain of disruption and dislocation. I shared this story before, but Shane Claiborne, who's a pastor in Philadelphia, started a great movement called Red Letter Christianity. He was approached after a speaking conference once, and and a gentleman came up to him and said, you know, Shane, just thank you so much for your teaching. I want you to know I accepted Christ in my heart as my Lord and Savior, and my life has never been better. I've never been happier. Everything is just great. And Shane said, that's awesome, brother. That, That Listen, that praise God. Um, I got to be honest with you, though, when I met Jesus, my life got screwed up. I saw everything different. I responded differently. I felt conviction. I know what we were created to be and who we were created to represent, yet I so desperately want to just present myself as the only option. Jesus was a disturber of the peace. Perhaps this Jesus longs to enter the confines of the temple of your own heart and your own life this morning. This same Jesus wants to break down walls that you've created in your mind that aren't real. The same Jesus who comes to us, arms spread wide, saying, tear me down and I will raise myself back up. And not only will I rise up, but I will then love you, not tear you down. Peter denies, Peter denies, Peter denies. But at the end of John, Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Church, do you love Jesus? It's impossible to fully experience God's love if you can't share it with humanity. Do you understand? God sees us despite all of our stuff. And Lord, help me, I got a lot of stuff. And despite all of our stuff, God says, I love you. Endlessly, I love you. Forever, I love you. And God says, I believe you're capable of loving people that way. Not some pie in the sky love, but some like hard work love. Like hard work. Will you do it? What would Jesus drive out of your life if you had Christ complete control over your decision making? What tables would he overturn in your soul? Is there a peace in you that demands disturbance this morning? Let us pray. Almighty God, Holy Christ, enter enter our lives and drive out our attachments and with them storms of anxiety and mistrust. Lord, upend the tables of our privilege and pride. Let the things that keep us from you go crashing to the floor. God, I ask this morning and every morning that you would reclaim your place in our lives as we reclaim ourselves in God's image. Help us to be the church that you have called us to be. Help us to be the church that goes into the world and fulfills the mission that you gave to us, that we would create the kingdom of heaven here and now. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Okay. Say with me the Apostles' Creed, please. I believe in God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he arose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us enter into a time of prayer for our church, our community, and the whole world. Let us pray. God, we thank you that you so long ago disturbed what some considered peace in the temple. That you argued for holy places. That you took away the barriers, those things that the church or the world had said for so many years separated us from God and you came to be with us physically, God. Help us to love you and worship you as the Savior who became one of us, who died for us, who rose for us, who lived for us, and help us to live for you, Lord, in your mercy. God, we give you thanks for all of those great prophets who have gone before us, those priests and priestesses who spoke into injustice, who spoke out against inequality, who argued against a church that was complicit with these things for so many, many years. We thank you for the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and so many others, God, who paved the way for conversations, for walls to be broken down, for barriers to be removed. And we pray for the ongoing work, Lord. Lord, in your mercy. God, we know there are people in this room who are suffering today, Lord people in our community who are suffering, people in this world who are suffering in mind, in body, and in spirit, God. We know you promise healing, Lord. We also know that you promise your presence. Help us, God, to be that presence in their life if we can be for your sake. We lift up those who are heavy on our hearts and minds at this time. Lord, in your mercy. God, you are a God of the living. We thank you for the lives of those who have gone before us, those saints of the church who have paved the way and taught us so much. Help us too, Lord, to be people who break into false, peaceful situations and disturb them. Help us to be people who are accused of loving radically. Help us to be people who fight for those who are considered weak, marginalized, or put aside. God, you spent so much of your ministry with the widows and the children and those who were cast out. Help us to spend our time with those who the world deems cast out or cast off. Help us to be the embodiment of your presence in this world, a world that so desperately needs your love, Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. God, I thank you for our new members. God, I thank you for for their willingness to come and stand in front of this church, but also to commit to this ministry that we are all partaking in here at Vernon, God. I pray that you would bless them and bless our relationship with them, bless our time together in ministry as we go out these doors this morning. And I pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Friends, the peace of the Lord be with you always. Please take some time, please, and share that peace with those among you. God's peace, everybody.
peace out. Let us give thanks to God for our offering. Lord, we thank you for the gifts of this church, Lord, the many gifts of this church that work in this physical space that go out into the community. We also thank you for the gifts that are given to this church, Lord, to help us to sustain the ministry of Vernon. In Christ's name we all say, amen. amen. Friends, please uh, take a look at the What's Happening wall here at VLC. Remember, we have our uh, Seniors Bible Study at 1030. And um, uh, can we wave to our friends at home? We didn't wave this morning. Yeah, I like it because they're all kind of like waving at you too, Ron. So it's like, um, just, uh, just, I love you all very much. Receive this blessing this morning as we go out of this place. May the holy disruptor, the God who brings peace into the world by calling out those who seek to divide, may that same God, that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Friends, go with Christ into a weary world and share the good news. Thanks be to God. Amen. Have a great Sunday, everybody.